According to First Hand, an organization that profiles and ranks companies based on employee insight, Goldman Sachs & Company was the most prestigious banking firm in America in 2021. It outranked the likes of Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan by an impressive margin too. If you check the employee review section, you'll see people raving about a company that actively promotes a work-life balance, provides a very competitive salary, has excellent compensation, a breadth of career development opportunities, and an incredibly open workplace, where all people are made to feel welcome and efforts to attract diversity are highly public and widely encouraged. Now, that sounds like a pretty sweet company to work for, right? Well, don't go sending in your resume just yet. Not unless you're happy working an average of 98 hours a week in an unforgiving environment, sacrificing your morals, and becoming part of a firm that is widely regarded as the most evil bank in the world. Hold on to your wallets, folks, because this is the story behind the Goldman Sachs. But before we continue, make sure you give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be the first to be notified of new behind-the-business videos that we post every week. Now, let's begin. If you're not entirely sure of what it is that Goldman Sachs actually does, you wouldn't be the first. In their own words, the Goldman Sachs Group Inc. is a leading global financial institution that delivers a broad range of financial services across investment banking, securities, investment management, and consumer banking to a large and diversified client base that includes corporations, financial institutions, governments, and individuals. If you're still none the wiser, then again, you wouldn't be the first. As with most villain origin stories, though, Goldman Sachs started out very different to the monster it has now become. It all began in 1869 when a German immigrant by the name of Marcus Goldman opened up a one-room office in Lower Manhattan in New York City. During an era where banks were being tight with credit, Goldman started buying people's promissory notes, which are basically an instrument of debt similar to an IOU, and selling them to New York's commercial banks. This became known as the commercial paper business. In 1882, he welcomed his son-in-law Samuel Sachs to the business, hence the name Goldman Sachs. He also brought his son, Henry Goldman, on board three years later, becoming Goldman Sachs & Company. After joining the New York Stock Exchange in 1896 and opening up offices in Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, Philadelphia, and St. Louis, Goldman Sachs became a leader in commercial paper sales. They also expanded into Europe and began providing a range of services including foreign exchange, letters of credit, gold shipments, and arbitrage. In the early 1900s, with clients in need of larger amounts of long-term capital, Goldman Sachs established its investment banking business. Then, in 1930, a senior partner named Sidney J. Weinberg, a.k.a. Mr. Wall Street, captained Goldman Sachs through the financial turmoil of the Great Depression. And by the end of the Second World War, he oversaw the revival of both the company and pretty much the U.S. economy. From there, Goldman Sachs thrived and became one of the top full-service investment banks in the United States. Operations expanded to London in 1970, then Tokyo and Zurich in 1974. Simply put, what started as a one-person operation in Lower Manhattan is now one of the most influential financial services firms in the world. With global teams representing a diverse range of backgrounds and experiences, Goldman Sachs currently employs over 43,000 people and in 2021 recorded a net income of 21.6 billion US dollars. There's nothing unusual or dodgy about that, I hear you cry. Well, let me introduce you to some of Goldman Sachs' famous faces. Being such a large wealthy organization, there's no denying that Goldman Sachs has employed some very smart individuals. As it happens, many of those same individuals have gone on to hold positions of great power and influence, which may or may not have benefited the firm they used to work for. Spoiler. It totally did. Henry Paulson, for instance, worked at Goldman Sachs for 32 years before becoming U.S. Secretary of the Treasury under President George W. Bush. When the 2008 housing crisis happened, it was up to Paulson to decide which firms to bail out, and more importantly, who not to bail out. As it happens, Lehman Brothers, a competitor of Goldman Sachs, were not bailed out and ended up folding as a result. Robert Rubin worked at GS for 26 years before serving in the White House as assistant to the President for Economic Policy then later as Secretary of the Treasury under Bill Clinton. Rubin paved the way for the dot-com bubble by allowing investment banks to quickly take companies public. He profited from taking early internet companies public before they'd inevitably go bust. Too bad for the investors. Robert Zellick was president of World Bank when $2 billion mysteriously went missing, apparently due to computer glitches. Guess where he had previously worked as a managing director? 
Yep, Goldman Sachs. Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary under Donald Trump, who was investigated for foreign corruption, formerly worked at Goldman Sachs. You get the picture. As many as 26 Goldman Sachs employees have gone on to hold such positions of influence, including presidential cabinet positions, the former CEO of the New York Stock Exchange, and high-ranking jobs within the European Central Bank, Bank of England, Canadian National Bank, and National Bank of Greece. Long live the Goldman Sachs Mafia. It's not just former employees that give rise to this mafia theory, though. In our recent Nestle video, we pointed out that when a company's Wikipedia page is dominated by controversies, it's kind of a huge red flag that indicates shady business practices. Well, not only is this the case for Goldman Sachs, but Wikipedia has an entire page solely dedicated to the long list of scandals and crises Goldman Sachs has been involved in. It would take us hours to go through just the controversies from 2008 onwards, but here are some of the highlights, or lowlights if you prefer. Following the 2007-08 financial crisis, Goldman Sachs was deemed to have misled its investors and to have profited from the collapse of the mortgage market. The firm was subsequently investigated by the U.S. Congress and the United States Department of Justice. Ultimately, the company ended up settling a lawsuit for $550 million with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. When AIG was bailed out by the government, Goldman came under fire for receiving $12.9 billion from counterparty payments, more than any other firm, almost as if it benefited them directly. Hmm. Goldman was also criticized for receiving $10 billion of government money under the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, though ultimately the firm repaid it in full. More outrage arose after Goldman put aside $11.4 billion for employee bonuses in 2009, at a time when most of the world was struggling financially. Other scandals include stock price manipulation. In 2003, along with Lehman Brothers and Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs was sued for artificially inflating the stock price of RSL Communications by basically lying in their research analyst reports. They ended up settling for $3,380,000. Completing the mafia cliché, Goldman Sachs has also been accused of taking bribes and avoiding paying tax. In 2016, a report by Citizens for Tax Justice concluded that Goldman Sachs reports having 987 subsidiaries in offshore tax havens, 537 of which are in the Cayman Islands, despite not operating a single legitimate office in that country, according to its own website. The group officially holds $28.6 billion offshore. Of course, they wouldn't be the only major U.S. bank or company to use this tactic, but that doesn't make it right. On top of all this, Goldman Sachs has consistently faced criticism over its lack of ethical standards and unhealthy work environments. In 2012, a former Goldman Sachs employee named Greg Smith quit the company and published a scathing op-ed article in the New York Times titled, Why I Am Leaving Goldman Sachs. After almost 12 years of service, having worked his way up from a summer intern position in New York to a vice president role in London, he wrote the following. I believe I have worked here long enough to understand the trajectory of its culture, its people, and its identity. And I can honestly say that the environment now is as toxic and destructive as I have ever seen it. In giving his reasons, he explained further. To put the problem in the simplest terms, the interests of the client continue to be sidelined in the way the firm operates and thinks about making money. Goldman Sachs is one of the world's largest and most important investment banks, and it is too integral to global finance to continue to act this way. It makes me ill how callously people talk about ripping their clients off. Oh, and if you think it's better to be a part of the mob rather than be one of its victims, consider this. In a survey from February 2021 titled, Working Condition Survey published by Goldman Sachs itself, 77% of first-year analysts polled said that they felt they had been a victim of workplace abuse. 75% said they had sought or were thinking about seeking counseling or therapy for their mental health due to the stress of the job. With the average mental health rating falling from an 8.8 out of 10 upon starting the job, to just 2.8 out of 10 afterwards. 100% of the employees asked said that their work hours, which averaged out at a ludicrous 98 hours per week, had negatively affected their relationships with friends and family. They only slept an average of five hours a night going to bed at 3 a.m. You still think the money's worth it? Most first-year analysts didn't, registering an average likelihood of just 3.5 out of 10 that they would continue to work at Goldman Sachs if working conditions stayed the same. 
Among the quotes from people surveyed were, My body physically hurts all the time, and mentally, I'm in a really dark place. This is beyond the level of hardworking. This is inhumane. Abuse. I've been through foster care, and this is arguably worse. With so many controversies and so much hatred towards Goldman Sachs, you may be wondering how they continue to thrive in today's world, especially at a time when transparency and company image are becoming more important, and businesses are being closely scrutinized now more than ever. Well, according to Business Insider, Goldman Sachs is like the mob, in that people deal with them not because they want to, but because they have to. Money manager Beth McLean even told Vanity Fair in 2009, Of course we do business with them. We have to. It's like the mob who picks up the garbage. You pay their fees because you need your garbage picked up. And, just like the mafia, Goldman Sachs puts on a front of respectability and decency, going about its business with just enough legitimacy as to disguise its wicked ways. On their website, Goldman Sachs lists its commitments as diversity and inclusion, community engagement, and sustainability. They claim that, supporting our clients, our people, and our communities in dynamic environments is core to what we do, and our culture and core values will continue to guide us as we look to the future. Would you believe them, or are they still the great vampire squid that sucks money instead of blood, and who allegedly engineered every major market manipulation since the Great Depression, that Matt Taibbi famously claimed they did in a Rolling Stone interview in 2009? Maybe it's unfair to criticize a company who in 2021 committed $30 million to a COVID-19 relief fund and $775 million to a small business stimulus package while advising governments around the world on raising more than $15 billion for vulnerable populations. They at least appear to be making an effort to change for the better, but appearances can be deceptive. After all, some people viewed Pablo Escobar as a Robin Hood type figure when he gave back to the community. So, is Goldman Sachs a necessary evil in the modern world or do you think we'd be better off without them? Let us know what you think in the comments. As always, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be the first to be notified of new behind the business videos we post every week. Be inspired and we will see you in the next one. Since you made it all the way to this point, here are two more videos that YouTube thinks you are going to love. Go on, click it. Let's see if they're right.